Welcome to Europalash TV. I am in New York together with Francois Serge Laviton. He is a professor of finance at ETEC, that's a university in Nice, France, South France, and he is also the chief investment officer at Cage Capital, which is a multifamily office based in Jersey, in the United Kingdom. Francois, if I would go to Nice and study at EdTech, what would I learn from you? I hope you would learn a lot of things. The, the goal of my courses in Nice is really to give my students a mix of the theory within the hedge fund world, within the financial world, but also the practice. How are, are things working in practice? And so I teach a little bit of the strategies, the models that the hedge funds are using to do arbitrage fixed income arbitrage, merger arbitrage, convertible arbitrage, goes from pricing, hedging, etc. All that you can learn in books, but the additional thing that you cannot learn in book is how does it work in practice? And that's what I'm trying to give also to my students is have them, you know, running a, a mini version of a hedge fund, have a look at some of the hedge funds that blew up and what can we learn from them, um, you know, whether it's LTCM or Amaranth or a Madoff case or whatever it is, but in practice, how is this working? And do they paper trade or do they trade real money? I think they trade real money, but not in my class. That's basically their, their private personal account. My simulated exercises are free. Francois, you had been doing research on hedge funds since 1994. And I believe you were one of the very early people that from an academic perspective were dedicating your research efforts towards hedge funds and alternatives. Tell me, how did academia get involved with hedge funds and alternative? What's the history and what's the evolution of academic research into hedge funds? So, I mean, it's a long story, but if I look back in the 90s, I would say the first research in hedge funds I can remember of were probably Fung models followed by a few people at the London Business School, Agarwal and Nike are the two I can think of. And they were all bringing the idea that, you know, hedge funds are nonlinear option-like payoffs of what's happening in the world, which was the first great element that, you know, financial theory brought to that world. You got a second line of thought, which is mostly from the US, Schneeweiss in particular, and a few others, we're mostly looking at CTA, systematic trading, factor models. Um, they also made a, a few interesting contributions to the world. I think my contribution came with EDEC, actually, and a few people at EDEC, uh, Noel Lamanc, Lionel Martellini, for instance, and also other people, which was to look at the risk dimension. And as a result of the risk dimension, the asset allocation dimension. Um, so essentially, how do you control the risk of a hedge fund portfolio? What are the key risk factors to analyze? And how should you allocate to hedge funds, both from a strategic long-term perspective and possibly from a short-term tactical one? Um, so that these are the sort of three lines of, of uh, you know, studies, research that I would say went from the early 90s to probably the late 2000s. You're obviously in a very unique position because you come from a very deep academic background and at the same time at KH Capital as the chief investment officer, you do run money, you do construct portfolios. Tell me more, how does your performance benefit from all that? What's all the good that's coming out of your research materializing? in your actual work as a chief investment officer? I mean, I have the, it's true, the advantage of, you know, being at the, the mix of two uh, very different areas. What I try to do when I build a portfolio, I like to say that I essentially focus on the downside of the portfolio. That's really my primary worry. I'm always thinking in terms of where can we lose money? Why can we lose money? The upside is the result of a fund selection and the quality of the managers. The upside takes care of itself. So when I run a portfolio, I think that what probably makes me very different is I'm really trying to focus on the downside risk much more than on capturing the upside. The upside basically is not in my hands. It's in the hands of the managers themselves. As a result, we do tend to have portfolios, I would say, that are much better reacting on the downside thanks to my risk management and much better reacting on the upside thanks to the quality of our portfolio managers. That's probably 
quite different. A lot of people invest in hedge funds to make a lot of money. That's not my approach. My approach is to invest in hedge fund and find back the old hedge world that a lot of funds have forgotten. Contribution from academia. I, you know, I want to understand what I invest into and I don't mind asking questions and coming back. And if, if something is not clear to me, I mean, I, I'll just ask until I understand. And it's not a problem if somebody can't explain something and I don't understand it, I would not invest into it. So there's a lot of strategies that you know, I, I never understood, never invested into them, and they turn out to be, in one case, a complete fraud. Madoff is a good example of that. But there are other cases where if, if we don't understand it, we just pass. And that has been the real philosophy. We want to understand why we make money, when do we possibly lose money, and what are the reasons. And if we can't use the academic background to sort of explain what we do, I mean, we'll just skip that. Please share with us some of the latest research that you had been doing on hedge funds. Sure. My research recently has been mostly applied and the reason is uh, I want to use it in, in my sort of day-to-day -day business. I'm essentially researching on topics that are directly relevant for me. I would say there are two, two lines of research that will result in some publications hopefully early next year. One is looking at the correlation variation between hedge fund, hedge fund style trading strategies. We all know that essentially correlation goes up in period of crisis, goes down generally, but I think things are much more different and much more asymmetric than that. So the idea is to really measure how correlation varies over time as, as a function of what does it vary, what drives correlation changes, and what's the impact of that on, on portfolio diversification. So that's the first line of research. What have you found? What drives correlation? Can you share with us just on the surface? Can you scratch the surface here? There's a variety of things that are relevant. They're not necessarily relevant for each hedge fund, but they are relevant across different hedge fund styles. Um, one of them is the cumulative PL that a hedge fund has realized since beginning of the year or since the last measurement period. The question is, is if a hedge fund has performed well, does it take more risk or less risk? And this has an impact on its correlation vis-a-vis -vis other hedge funds. The second thing, which is quite important, is the what I would call the market nervousness, uh, which I would not necessarily associate with volatility. There were periods where market were very nervous, but everything was crashing down with very little volatility. So that's the second, the second indication. The third one, which is relatively interesting, is the mismatch or match between the assets and the liabilities of the fund. And what you find is hedge funds that are mismatched tend to react differently from funds that are properly matched. Basically, People can adjust their portfolios versus they're stuck in a trade and they cannot get out of a trade. So these are some of the you know, aspects that I'm trying to highlight. And these have direct implications in terms of how do you build a portfolio. Because if correlation change, a 10-year correlation between two time series is useless. It's an average correlation which tells you nothing. The second line of uh, research is basically looking at factor models. It's an old, you know, explored area. And what I'm trying to do there is um, a lot of people try to analyze portfolios by running a factor model at the portfolio level. I'm basically taking the opposite approach, which is to run short-term factor models using weekly or even daily data, fund by fund, and then aggregating those factor models to get a portfolio factor model. And the result of that is you can measure much better the you know, well-documented non-linear reaction of hedge funds at the fund level and then try to aggregate to determine the payoff of the overall fund versus the independent components. What I'm trying to do there is really get a better understanding of how a hedge fund would evolve should some of the environmental variables, you know, credit spreads, volatility, commodity prices change. And it's a series of nonlinear reactions. So trying to aggregate that to get the, the sort of portfolio reaction. And it, interesting findings there is that if you start using more frequent data, weekly, typically, you capture a much different behavior than by using end of the month. It's much more detailed. You can cap the uh, 
shorter term variations, which typically non-fan data doesn't necessarily capture. So Francois, tell me more about Catch Capital. Catch Capital was essentially created in 2001 by a Swiss family called Bertarelli, and essentially to run their assets. So we grew up over the years. Hedge funds is one of the activities we do. We do also have a private equity portfolio. We do have a biotech group. We do have um, a real estate group. There, there are a few business units, if you want, at, at Catch. I'm in charge of the hedge fund group. And the hedge fund group in terms of hedge fund assets is between five and six billion dollars. So it's a relatively large player in the hedge fund world. We've been very discreet and not a lot of people know us essentially because, I mean, we, we don't interface a lot with the external world. Our managers know us well. We're known in what I would call the specialized uh, hedge fund world. But it's true that we're, we've been relatively under the radar for many years. Also, what's your view on the future of hedge funds? It's a great question. I think the hedge fund world is generally getting riskier. And the reason for that, I would say, is twofold. The first one, there's a huge political risk, both in Europe and in the United States, which is coming against hedge funds and against financial strategies in general. And I think that could be a threat to the development of the hedge fund industry in general. There is a second risk to the, to the hedge fund world, which I think worries me significantly, is the fact that essentially the crisis has, has, has been going from a, a market crisis to a liquidity crisis. And everybody knows how to deal with market crisis and liquidity crisis. But it's been shifting now into government or state solvency crisis. And we've already seen some of the issues with Greece, Ireland, and you know there could be a couple of other countries. U.S. are getting increasingly challenged given their deficit. Now, how does it plug back to the um, to the hedge funds? It's basically a threat that a large number of hedge funds have not considered, and a large number of hedge funds are U.S. based, while a large number of threats are actually coming from a new danger, government solvency, from the developed world. And I'm not sure these risks have been captured, embedded, assessed the right way in investment strategies. So for me, that's something I'm, I'm increasingly concerned with in terms of investments. There hasn't been research around this, as far as I know. But I think the fact that the Western world could face solvency crisis, that's completely unknown. And that's obviously uh, very detrimental, not only to the hedge funds, but to the whole financial system. It is, absolutely. Okay. I mean, it, it, hedge funds are just uh, you know a tiny portion of the financial world. But it will ultimately affect consumers. It will ultimately affect all of us if something happens. And you know what worries me is uh, it's there. Nobody seems to address it. Everybody seems to be gaining time to postpone the problem. But we're just making the problem bigger. One day it will have to get solved. There are many bearish views on Greece, right? That they just postponed the final end for another two or three years. What's your view on Greece? I'm sure you have studied it a little bit more in detail than I. The solution, what is the solution to these problems? It's very tough to find one and I honestly don't have one. I think the problem of austerity is it can only do a limited amount of debt reduction. It's extremely unpopular, it kills the growth, and it's at the expense of some people. If you want to, given the size of the problem, if you want to cure the problem that way, you'll get social unrest, basically, and people in the street. Default, restructuring, call it whatever you want. There is a political obstacle, which is a couple of countries are against any European member, EU member, to restructure its debt. Now, it has happened a number of occasions. That's maybe the solution. If a corporation is having problems, they get refinanced. In the US, it's a common practice. Maybe the states have to do it. Emerging markets were used to restructure their debt. And the last big restructurings were in 1997 with the Asian crisis. They've learned a lot by restructuring. Today, they're in a great condition compared to European countries. So might very well be that the emerge of yesterday will become the emerging of today. They want to re-emerge. Maybe restructuring is a solution. And it's better to restructure orderly than to end up in a crisis where you know nobody really has a solution except putting more leverage into the system in order to rescue some of the most leveraged players. And there is a moral hazard in that, which is huge.